It all started on a pleasant April morning. It was a gorgeous Saturday, the windows were open in deference to the unusually mild temperature. The birds were singing, the air was fresh and clean, and Norman Rockwell was going to town. I headed to the kitchen to get started on breakfast. I usually drink coffee, but sometimes I fall into a tea depression, lasting for weeks at a time. I filled my favorite teapot, left to me by my grandmother, put it on the stove, and got the bags ready for the signal whistle. As soon as the kettle started to sing, I would put the sachet in the water, turn off the gas, set the timer on the microwave, and say in as pompous an English a voice as possible, tea, Earl Grey, hot. I laughed silently at my wit, yes, I am witty. I had just had time to squeeze the last drops from the bags and close the lid of the teapot when the doorbell heralded a visitor. I opened the door to my surprise, it wasn't a JW, a Girl Scout, or some lawyer, it was Trudy, my best friend Brad's wife. Brad and I had known each other since middle school, attending different colleges but had been in each other's orbit most of the time since we met. He had married Trudy three years earlier. She had known my wife, Audrey, at least well enough to mourn her passing six months later. Trudy and I never really hit it off, per se. We were both very attached to Brad, and there was no underlying animosity to overcome, we just didn't hit it off. It's hard to explain. Anyway, she stood there, looking very unhappy. I stepped aside, she walked in. Would you like some tea? I asked, trying to play the good host. She sniffed the air uncertainly, Earl Grey, she asked. I grinned, nice nose, I muttered. Yeah, that's what's on the menu, just finished brewing it. She smiled thinly, yeah, that would be good. I escorted her into the kitchen. She sat down at a small table in the breakfast nook. I set cups and saucers on the table, poured tea, asked her preferences for sugar and milk, none and none, and sat down. She was silent, savoring her tea, and looked like she was about to cry. Can I talk to you about something? She asked sharply. Was this a disturbing call? Sure, I answered, more calmly than I felt. I mean, it's just about you and me. I need to know that I can count on you not to talk to Brad about it, she said, her voice strained. Okay, that was definitely a red flag. Still, I reasoned, if she'd come to me, it must be serious. I looked her in the eye and said, you have my word. She was silent for a moment longer, and then, I think, I'm pretty sure, Brad is having an affair. That took all the emotional spirit out of me. I couldn't believe it. Brad had seen how my first wife's infidelity had hurt me. I couldn't believe he would turn around and hurt his own wife. Do you have any real proof? I asked, or is it just suspicion? She took another minute to gather her thoughts. The text messages on his cell phone, the hang-ups on his home phone, and it's so awkward, he barely touches me at all. Brad? I whispered, Mr. Horndog? I froze, realizing what I'd said. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But I mean, Trudy, he really likes it, I whispered. Things weren't going well. I'm sorry, I meant, she interrupted me. I know he told you we have a good sex life, he told me that himself. He also swore he never said it outright. I nodded, I know, he finds your feminine charms more than appropriate. She smiled thinly and tiredly. We both sat in silence. Finally, I said, okay, so what can I do to help? What do you want me to do? She sighed, I don't know, she said. I'm still so upset, I haven't had time to think things through. Maybe it was a mistake. No, I said in a firm voice, if Brad is doing something like this, it's up to me to change his mind if he's cheating, she said quietly, there's no getting him back. You're right about one thing, he told me a little bit about your first marriage, about what you went through. If he could do that to me, after what he saw, well, I'd never trust him again. The marriage would be over. That hit me hard. Again, I realized that I had two options, on the one hand, I could warn Brad, and if he came forward, he would either stop it, or, more likely, go on undercover. On the other hand, I could peep on him and find out if he was getting off, so I had to choose between helping him, letting him do to Trudy what Noreen had done to me, and exposing him as the liar Trudy feared, 
which would cost us our friendship. Suddenly, I realized that I had rushed things. I hadn't even considered the possibility that he might be innocent. Perhaps she'd dreamed the whole thing, perhaps she'd watched too many episodes of Mori, or any one of several possibilities was perfectly reasonable. My confusion must have been clearly visible, for Trudy said, I guess I got it all mixed up. I walked over and took her hand, I have a lot to think about. I'll keep your trust, it's just that I've never done any investigative work. Give me some time to make a plan, I'll help you. A tear leaked out of each eye. Thank you, Jeff. You're a good friend. We stood as one, hugged briefly, and I walked her to the door. When she left, I sat down on the couch, one beautiful April morning shattered to pieces. My sister married a guy named Chuck, who has a brother named Frank. Frank is an investigator at a nationally known firm, I've met him a few times, and he seemed nice enough. I asked Chuck to ask Frank to contact me if he would be willing to do so and advise me on a matter of interest. Frank called me the next evening. I explained at length that I wasn't trying to be Dick Tracy or Mike Hammer, and then briefly told him what Trudy had told me. When I finished, I paused and asked, well, what do you think? There was silence so long I thought he had passed out. Just before I was about to ask if he was on, he said, okay, let's do this. I can't run an investigation off the books. I'm loyal to my company, I don't think that's what you're asking, but I have to make it clear. I understand, I said, and thank you for whatever you can do. Okay, he repeated slowly, she came to you, I think, because you can get close to him. That means you can get into his car, truck, whatever, and plant a little GPS bug. I can point you in the right direction in your neighborhood, then you just follow him. If he's on the move, you just wait for him to stop and drive by. For God's sake, whatever you do, don't try to act tailgating. Then, when and if you find him somewhere he especially doesn't belong, and the more times the better indicator, don't barge in like Dirty Harry. I repeat, don't barge in. You tell your wife to hire a private investigator for a day or so and have them gather some dirt. No cops. I asked, where's the crime? He asked somewhat animately, I thought, sure, it's messy, but the cops don't care about that. You just find out the basics, and if there's a fire where there's smoke, you pass it on to the smoke jumpers. Well, it all made sense to me. We talked for a few more minutes. I thanked him profusely. He apologized for biting my head off and then explained that most amateurs don't understand the legal dynamics behind marital infidelity. Marriage was invented for two reasons, he opined, to make children legal and to give private investigators, lawyers a steady stream of income. I found this cynical but held back. Then I thanked him, and we dispersed. At least I had the rudiments of a plan. Over the next few weeks, I put together some of the points Frank had mentioned. I progressed slowly, but I wanted to be right without getting caught up in the day-to-day. -day. I found reasons to ride with Brad in both his car and his SUV and install GPS bugs in each without arousing suspicion. I frequently and secretly updated Trudy on my progress. During one of our conversations, I asked how things were going. Worse, she replied, with great sadness on her face. He hasn't touched me since I came to see you last weekend. He got really rude, and at one point, I thought he was going to hit me. At that memory, she brushed away a few tears. Was this really the man I had known for so long? It was hard to comprehend. I assured her I was getting good data, and it would be over soon. I had followed Brad several times, despite Frank's warnings, and found that he periodically went to a certain house on a certain street on certain days. In addition, he would leave work, walk to the house, pull into the garage with what appeared to be a remote control, close the door, and back out almost exactly 35 minutes later, and always around lunchtime. The bastard had noon. There's a great wife sitting at home craving his touch, and he's having fun with some other guy's wife. I wrote down the address, and upon making inquiries, found out the name of the owner of the record, Dennis Roberts, married to Denise Roberts. Dennis, as I found out after even more careful questioning, worked, I had to laugh, as a divorce attorney. One day, as Brad's car disappeared behind the garage door, I picked up my cell phone and called Dennis Roberts's office. 
I was greeted with the usual, he isn't here. I loudly told the receptionist that was about his wife. A short pause followed, and then, this is Dennis Roberts speaking. What are you saying about my wife? She's having sex with another man right now, you need to hurry home and take care of business. I used a fake accent and spoke with the voice of an asthmatic. I closed the receiver and sat down to watch the fireworks. Fifteen minutes later, the car I assumed rightly Dennis Roberts was driving squealed out from around the corner and stopped in the driveway. Roberts slammed the car door, entered the house without further ado, and moments later, Brad popped out of the front door, wrapped in a sheet, desperately dialing a number on his cell phone that I assumed again rightly was 911. He was screaming into the phone, and as Roberts was walking out the front door, Brad yelled into the receiver, he's going to kill me, and pointed the phone in Roberts' direction. That slowed the lawyer down, he knew he'd be in deep if he hurt the guy, regardless of the reason. The cops arrived three minutes later, and while they were trying to figure things out, I stepped out from behind a bush that served as meager and unnecessary camouflage. Brad saw me, our eyes met, and his face contorted into a mask of hatred. He knew I'd set him up. I walked back to my car that was parked a block away from the house, got in it, and sat there, crying for a minute. After cleaning myself up, I drove home. When I realized from the GPS that Brad had come home, I called Trudy's cell phone and told her I was coming over and why. I think I heard a sob as I hung up. I arrived a few minutes later, it wasn't far, only 20 blocks or so, and Trudy opened the door. I froze on the porch for a moment, then Brad pushed Trudy aside and started yelling at me. You bastard, he bellowed. I wasn't sure what he was saying to Trudy, so I acted calm. I calmly replied, what are you talking about, Brad? He was breathing heavily. I gave him a chance to gather his thoughts and said, anything to do with Denise Roberts? He blushed several shades of red. I turned to Trudy and said, I saw him being kicked out of the house today, with an irate husband keeping pace. Son of a hasn't learned a lesson from what Noreen did to me. Brad shrieked and swung at me. I was ready, I hit the bastard with my mace, to which he responded with all sorts of obscenities. In parting, I said, Trudy, I'll be a witness in any trial you undertake. You were right. I left in confusion. The divorce went pretty smoothly, from what I heard. When Brad was caught red-handed and by a court official, he had no bargaining chips left, he was ruined. I was never called to testify about what I saw or did. Trudy, of course, kicked him out. He moved to an apartment in another part of town and changed jobs, he found something in the same field, but he wouldn't be able to continue working for the firm that had hired him. Well, good, I thought. I hate to see someone suffer, regardless of the reasons. I mourned the loss of my friend and let life go on. It was Saturday night, about eight months after this whole sordid affair had begun. I hadn't heard from Brad, which wasn't surprising, and neither had Trudy. I was just pondering that fact when the doorbell rang. Trudy was standing there. I smiled at the sight of her. Come on in, I said. I was just thinking about you. She answered my smile with a smile of her own, albeit a weak one. We made our way into the living room and sat down. Would you like some tea? I asked. She shook her head. No, but if you have anything stronger. Ah, uh, I said, coffee. She laughed, for the first time in my presence in many months. No, I mean something with a kick. I grinned. I see what you meant. Johnny Black. Her eyes widened. Sounds good, she said, smiling like she really meant it. And great for me, she added. I pulled a bottle of Johnny's from my stash and a couple of glasses, poured a shot each, and said, you're making a toast. She thought for a second. To what was, and to what will be. Here, here, I replied. We raised our glasses and drank. We sat on the couch and talked. To my surprise, that glass turned into a second glass, and that glass turned into a third. I was beginning to worry that Trudy was too intoxicated to drive home, but her eyes remained clear, her words slurred, and I decided to put the bottle away. She didn't mind. We chatted about nothing, 
but without the glass and with her guard down, she began to open up little by little. I can't tell you how grateful I am for your help, Jeff, she said, and there was a tremor in her voice. I don't like being divorced, but I hate what he did to us. She let a few tears fall, then continued. After you left that day, and he stopped fighting, I asked him about Noreen. Was that your first wife? I nodded. She nodded back and continued, I asked again and again until he finally stopped prevaricating and told me what had happened. Then he told me about himself, and that the lawyer's wife. She started crying because I think, deep down, he knew he'd messed up big time. I was silent for a moment. Yeah, I said quietly, I'm having a hard time believing it myself, but you turned out to be the friend I needed. She said, I don't know why I didn't meet you before I met Brad. She leaned a little closer as she spoke, her forehead pressed against mine, our faces touching, caressing each other, and then the kiss happened. In a second, we went from dead stop to full lips touching, our needs, desires, and frustrations bursting out, urging us forward. I placed my hands on her breasts, she pulled away, demanding more, wanting to make sure she was attractive to a man. She broke the kiss and stood up. Let's go, she whispered, her voice hoarse with desire. I led her into the bedroom, or we undressed. The alcohol was clouding my brain, not so much that I didn't realize what I was doing but enough to distort my perception. After mutual release, we lay there, sad, wanting more but unable to fulfill the demand. The right side of her face resting on my left shoulder, her left hand resting on my chest. Through my fading consciousness, I heard her voice, Jeff, she said softly. Yes, I replied in a barely audible whisper. Thank you, thank you for wanting me, she said, her voice sad, almost melancholy. I patted her arm with my left hand, grinned slightly, and said, it was my pleasure, dear lady. She snuggled even tighter against me. I reached down to pull back the sheet, and we sank into rest as one. The next morning, she was still there. I gazed into her features, so sharp, so delicate, so beautiful. She felt me looking at her, her eyes opened, she looked up at me and a smile lit up her face as she whispered, good morning. I kissed her forehead. All the best to you too, beautiful. She made the same motion she'd made the night before, almost like a dog wagging its body with uncontrollable glee. We got up and headed for the galley, where we took turns doing what one does in the galley, brushed our teeth, showered, and went to the kitchen, where we made each other a hearty breakfast. As we ate, I ventured to ask, do you have any thoughts about last night? She set the dishes aside and focused on my face. I'm not married, you're widowed. We're two single adults who decided to make love to each other. She looked at me as if waiting for some kind of conclusion. I smiled. You're right, I said. She smiled back with all the strength a woman is capable of. So Trudy and I entered into a sexual relationship, and I began to hope it would develop into love. I know it sounds hackneyed but it really did, and that was the problem. When Trudy divorced Brad, the housing market in our area was tight, however, about six months after we became lovers, the market picked up, and Trudy started spending more time with her realtor. She spent almost every night with me, she had started taking the pill again. She was still emotionally fragile, despite my gift of multiple ecstasies almost every night. She knew how I felt, and I thought I knew how she felt, but appearances may not be completely honest. One night, she came home to my house, our house, and asked me to sit with her in the living room. I didn't anticipate anything good, and I turned out to be right. Jeff, she said quietly, Marge found a buyer for the house. Marge was her realtor. That's great, I replied, without much enthusiasm. The deal will be done in less than three weeks, she continued, and then I'll be moving back to Cooper City, to live closer to my family. I knew it was going to happen, it was inevitable, but that didn't make it hurt any less. Not. We hugged for a few moments, and then she went to pack her things. I sat in the living room, while she did that, unable to believe that she hadn't asked me if I wanted to go with her. She never brought it up, which was a sure sign that she was just breaking things off neatly, irrevocably. She entered the living room again, carrying a small suitcase behind her back. I didn't look at her. She leaned over, kissed me on the top of my head, 
and said, goodbye, my darling. She turned and walked out the door, closing it behind her. I sat and cried a few tears of self-pity, and then, having finished, I got up, washed the dishes, and prepared for the next day. The days rushed by, one boring piece of calendar after another, for another two years, maybe a little more. My career was moving along, a few girlfriends kept me company from time to time, and I was content, if not truly happy. Then, on another Saturday night, just after dinner, I heard a knock on the door. I had long ago given up the practice of grabbing my Louisville slugger as I approached the door. I had long feared Brad's wrath and kept that bat close to the front door. Imagine my surprise when, upon opening the door, I saw Brad. I reached for the slugger, keeping it in plain sight but not out of reach. Hey, Brad, I said cautiously. Jeff, he replied, can I come in? I want to talk to you. I don't want any trouble, old buddy, I replied, putting emphasis on the last two words. He looked at me, as if startled, genuinely sad. No, buddy, it's not like that, he replied, with an unhappy look. I really, honestly, just want to talk. I hesitated, then stepped aside. He walked in, realizing he was persona non grata, and sat down in the chair he'd almost always used in the old days. I sat down and gave him time to gather his thoughts. Eventually, he said, Jeff, I've hated you for so long. We were friends for so long, and now I've hated you for three long years. His breath hitched, but he continued, I've harbored a hatred for you that has become so corrosive, it's eating me alive. It's killing me, Jeff, to hate the one I love. Tears ran down his face, a couple tried to escape from my eyes as well. He pulled himself together, and then I met someone else. Lissa, she's great, you'd like her. I was telling her about my past, it was probably a couple of months ago when I broke down. I finally admitted to her, and to myself, what an idiot I was. He was crying quite openly now. I put my hand on his knee, he grasped it and apparently found the strength to continue. She was cheated on, and here I was, a good fellow, cheating on my own wife. She said she understands that everyone deserves another chance and all that, but I can't be a part of her life until I've done other people wrong, until I make things right. I held back a scathing reply. I told her I'd do it, but then I realized she wasn't just talking about Trudy, she wants me to rebuild us, and she's right. For a few moments, he sobbed, goddammit, I want my friend back. He tilted his head forward and sobbed like a child. I was moved to tears. I leaned over, kissed his head, shook him slightly, and said, it's okay, buddy, it's okay, as if soothing a child. He put his arm around my shoulders, kissed my neck, and broke into more intense sobs. He cried for three minutes or more, and I joined him, rubbing his back and making what I hoped were soothing sounds. Eventually, he pulled away and calmed down. Our shirts were wet with mixed tears. He wiped his face and said, how about that, you're doing? We both laughed heartily. You see, I had always liked gourmet coffee, and he was drinking taster's choice on a good day. I told him he was drinking brown piss, he called my coffee frou-frou, another way of saying gay, I guess. If you've ever seen Pulp Fiction, you'll remember the scene in Jimmy's kitchen, if not, watch the movie for that scene. Anyway, I went into the kitchen, Brad following me. I brewed a big pot of Gavala signature, poured the beer into mugs, handed one to him, and sat down at the table with him. He whispered, I might learn to like this, after all. We both laughed. Brad and I still hadn't fully recovered our relationship and probably never would, but we were much closer than we had been recently. I'd met his new girlfriend, and with his permission, tested everything she believed in, at her request. The two of us had dinner together a couple of times, I gave her enough reasons to leave him without intending to sabotage him. I believe she wants to know the truth, whatever it takes, and she is still firmly on his side. She's already come to terms with his past, so perhaps, after all is said and done, I did the right thing. I got a letter from Trudy the other day, she's getting married. The letter had no invitation, no date, no place. I guess I've been excluded, in a way, that's okay. I wish her well.